Welcome to this Simply the Truth live debate with me, Doug Harris. It's a special evening, uh, as we have from time to time, where we have two people giving opposite points of view on a particular subject, not to confuse our viewers, but so that the viewers can have an understanding of the way different people look at things and be encouraged to search the scriptures for themselves to find out what is being said. And tonight, the special debate is on the whole subject of the mass and transubstantiation. Uh, something which lots of people have talked to us about in the past. I'm not going to talk about it anymore. I'm going to hand it over uh, to my special guest tonight. And first of all, I want to invite uh, and welcome Cecil Andrews. Thank you for joining us, Cecil. Cecil uh, is from the Apologetic Take Heed Ministries in Northern Ireland. And you've taken part in such debates before, uh, especially uh, earlier this year, wasn't it, on the whole position of Mary. Thank you for coming back and joining us again. And uh, Peter, Peter Williams. Welcome, Peter, from Catholic Voices. Uh, a former atheist who now speaks out for the Catholic faith. And you too, are. I'm welcoming you back because uh, well, it's been a couple of years or so ago when we did a debate oh, on yeah. should the Pope come to England. Indeed, so. And you were there saying, so, yes, yes, yes. And you won because he came, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> but... Uh, uh, we, uh, we, we want you also to take part in this debate. Um, we're obviously going to let uh, both uh, the people here in the studio uh, have an opportunity uh, to talk very clearly, but we want your texts and your emails. I get as many of them in as I can. Can't guarantee to do them all. Uh, so please do get them in as early as you can. Text 07781 472847. Emails live at revelationtv.com and I'll say we'll get as many of them in as we can. But straight to you, Peter. Uh, seven minutes for you to lay the foundation of how you see the mass and transubstantiation. Well, thanks so much, Doug, and thank you very much, Cecil, for coming as well, and uh, thank you, everyone, for listening in. I think this debate really centers for us as Christians on the central act of how Christ saves us and very particularly on how he exercised and exercises his New Testament ministry as high priest of the new covenant and the victim of the sacrifice that he would make on the cross and that would form the source of our salvation. I think when we look at that in its full context, we see the Catholic Church, the church that he founded, and her doctrine of the mass and of transubstantiation. Holy Scripture makes it very clear that Christ is our high priest. Hebrews 4.14, Hebrews 9.11, we have a great high priest in Christ Jesus. Um, in uh, John 19, 23, it mentions that Christ has the katone, the, 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 the girdle that the high priest would wear, the tunic he would wear when he made a sacrifice whilst he's on the cross. This is, you can see this in Exodus 28 and Leviticus 16. But Christ is also the paschal lamb. John 1, 29, John the Baptist says, here comes that the lamb of God shall take away the sins of the world. John, uh, the apostle John, describes the lamb of God sitting in heaven in Revelations. So it's in the light of these truths and their Jewish context that, I'll see, that we see the full um, interest of the cedar meal. The last supper was a cedar meal, the Passover meal. Uh, we see very much from the text that that's what they were preparing for. It was the 14th day of Nisan when they had the Passover meal. And God mandated that all Jews would observe this meal in Exodus 12, which it is commanded that they would take an unblemished lamb, they would kill it, and they would eat it that very night. And what developed in Jewish culture, and what they had this, this, to this day, is a ritual liturgy, the Haggadah, surrounding those basic commandments, based on a four-part structure. And it was basically set up to, to revolve around four cups of wine. And um, we see this in the part of a seed that was celebrated at the Last Supper itself. You had the Kadush, uh, the prayer that was spoken at the beginning with over a first cup of wine. Then you had a second stage, the Passover liturgy, where they would describe what happened in Exodus. And you had the little Hillel, the Psalm 113, and the second cup of wine. But when we get to the Last Supper, we see the third cup, the cup of blessing. Grace was spoken over the unleavened bread and the, the lamb that was eaten. The celebrant would say a prayer, in this case that was Jesus. And then they would be passed around and drunk by all the participants, as well as the lamb et by all the participants. Then we reach the climax, the great Hillel, a hymn of praise, comprising Psalm 115 through to 118, inclusive. And the closing note of which, that fourth cup, what some scholars call the cup of consummation, was passed round. 
Now, this is all really interesting. I mean, if you want to go into more detail, there's a German scholar called Joachim Uraneus who's talked about this more. But for our purposes this evening, it's important to note that we've seen the third cup that Christ blessed. We saw them sing in the text the great Hillel, the great hymn. But then afterwards, they go off. They don't drink the fourth cup. And more importantly, and very crucially here, they don't eat a lamb. Now that's really important, we'll see a little bit later. But with regards to the fourth cup, we do see that coming later on in the text when we see the crucifixion. Christ swears in the, before the great Hillel is, is um, sung that he won't drink of the, uh, the, the fruit of the vine again, Mark 14, 25. Um, later on, however, in the crucifixion, uh, he, he refuses wine, but then later on, on the sixth hour, this being the hour that the, the Passover lamb would be slaughtered, generally speaking, in the temple, always, Christ says, I thirst. And they take a hyssop branch, the same branch that would sprinkle the lamb's blood in the Old Testament. They put a, a sponge of sour wine, vinegar, it's sour wine, and he drinks it. And when he drinks it, he then says, tetelestai, it is accomplished. What is accomplished? The Passover liturgy. He drank the fourth cup. But we still haven't seen the lamb. In the entirety of the Last Supper, there's no lamb yet. Now that's really important. The reason it's really important is if that was the one part of the whole ritual that was mandated by the law. If they did not eat the lamb, they did not fulfill the seed of meal. If they didn't fulfill the seed of meal, they did not fulfill the law. If Christ did not fulfill the law, he sinned because sin is not fulfilling the law or to break the law. And if that's the case, he is not our sinless savior and he cannot perform the sacrifice for our sins. This cuts right to the heart of our whole religion. But what we see in the Last Supper is precisely that. Jesus says, this is my body. What is Jesus again? He's the lamb. He says, this is my body, broken for you, and they go and they eat the bread. That is, they eat him. We will see this when we go into, into more exegesis later on. We don't have the time to do it right now in this. But he then tells them to do this as an anamnesis of me. The reason why anamnesis, that Greek word, is important is that it doesn't just mean mere remembrance. In the context, it means memorial sacrifice. It's the one word for remembrance in the entirety of New Testament Greek that has that connotation of sacrifice. You can see the same word used in the Septuagint in Numbers 10.10, Leviticus 24.7, and also then in the New Testament in Hebrews 10.3. So when we see what Jesus is doing in the Last Supper, when we see it in its full Jewish context, what we find is precisely what the, Christ, the Catholic Church professes. We see a propitiatory sacrifice, the same sacrifice as that of Calvary, united to the Eucharist, the new covenant sacrifice that would continue on. And that Christ gives him, give us himself, his own flesh and his own blood to drink, to bless us. And I just want to give everyone listening into this program, the opportunity to accept that, to delight over it, and partake in it in the Holy Catholic Church. Thank you. Um, Cecil, your opportunity to uh, respond <coughs> to those initial remarks. Well, I'm really going to respond to uh, the question you put to me, which was why I am in opposition to the doctrine of the Mass. I'll come, no doubt, later to what Peter has specifically said. In the 1994 Catholic Catechism, it states in paragraph 1367, the sacrifice of Christ and the sacrifice of the Eucharist are one single sacrifice. Well, as I say, there are significant differences between Calvary and the Eucharist, which Rome claims are one single sacrifice. At Calvary, we read in Hebrews 9, 14, that Christ offered himself without spot to God. The priest who offered Christ and the sacrifice offered Christ, each were both spotless and sinless. Now, that was a, a unique combination. It had never happened before Calvary, and it has never happened since Calvary. At Calvary, no one assisted Christ. Yet Rome claims that Christ still offers himself through the ministry of its, its priests, that somehow with the help and participation of their priests, Calvary is perpetuated in the Mass. The sinless Christ the only priest after the unchangeable and untransferable priestly order of Melchizedek, Hebrews 7, he offered himself to his father and he obtained eternal redemption. And having done that, he cried out, as Peter said, it is finished. But Roman Catholics are taught that in the mass, the priest actually becomes in some sense, the actual person of Jesus Christ by acting in his person in such a way that Christ is offering himself in an unbloody offering to God in order to obtain 
eternal redemption. You know, someone acting in the person of Christ is not actually Christ any more than Meryl Streep acting in the person of Margaret Thatcher is not actually Margaret Thatcher. Actors simply role play, but they do not become the person portrayed. Yet Rome teaches that somehow sinful men become in some way proxy Christs and are able to represent the sacrifice of Christ to God. There is no scriptural basis for Rome's claim for any such priestly role. Jesus Christ alone is holy, harmless, undefiled, and separate from sinners. Yet according to Romans 3 and 1 John 1, all people, including Roman Catholic priests, as sadly we've seen in recent years, are sinful men. Yet Rome teaches in the Catechism 1128, from the moment that a sacrament is celebrated, the power of Christ and his spirit acts in and through it independently of the personal holiness of the minister. What a contrast to the concern that the Apostle Paul had for his personal holiness, 1 Corinthians 9. But I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I preach to others, I myself should become disqualified. You know, the words of Ezekiel 22 could, I believe, descriptively be applied to Rome's teaching. Her priests have violated my law and have profaned my holy things. They've put no difference between the holy and the profane. Neither have they shown difference between the unclean and the clean. God's word states clearly in Proverbs 15, 8, the sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination unto the Lord. And Isaiah 5 says, woe unto them that call evil good. Any attempt by Rome to link sinful men in with the sacrifice of the lamb without blemish and without spot, as Peter puts it in 1 Peter 1, is destined for failure before the God who is of purer eyes than to behold evil and cannot look on iniquity, Habakkuk 1. Guilty, vile, and helpless we, including Roman Catholic priests, spotless lamb of God was he, full atonement cannot be, hallelujah, what a savior. For in Hebrews 9, we read, Christ, a high priest of good things to come, by his own blood entered in once into the holy place. That's heaven, having obtained eternal redemption. The Bible states clearly that Jesus Christ presented his own blood as a propitiatory sacrifice in the holy place in heaven once for all. Yet Rome insists that thousands upon thousands of sacrifices are now presented to God and according to their Eucharistic prayer are carried up to God by angels. So there's a different offerer. Then there's a different outcome. Calvary secured a new covenant between God and his chosen people and under it twice he promised in Hebrews their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. In addition, we need to note that the blood shed by Christ cleanses from all sin, 1 John 1, but not so with the Mass. No Roman Catholic is allowed to claim to possess such a permanent blessing concerning the permanent and total cleansing from their sins. In fact, if they do so, they're guilty of the mortal sin of presumption. Having partaken of the Eucharist, which is supposedly the same sacrifice as that of Calvary, only their venial sins are dealt with, not mortal, according to the Catechism 1394 and 1395. And a temporary but wholly insecure state of justification is entered into. So there's a different outcome. And then finally, there is a different God. According to the Catechism, after transubstantiation, God the Son is contained in a consecrated wafer, which must, according to the Council of Trent, be given latria worship. That's the worship due alone to God. Now, whether being distributed to those attending Mass or being reserved in a tabernacle or being displayed in a monstrance, God supposedly indwells this wafer work of human hands. The unconverted Paul, Saul as he was then, he heard the soon-to-be martyred Stephen declare in Acts 7, the Most High dwelleth not in temples made with hands. And Paul later repeated that on Mars Hill in Acts 17. A temple is where worship is offered. And to give latria worship to a God supposedly encased in a man-made wafer of bread is to violate the truth of Scripture and to be guilty of the sin of idolatry. The Christ that is worshipped in the wafer is a different God. And along with the different offerer and the different outcome from that revealed in the scriptures, it is clear that Calvary and the Mass cannot possibly constitute one single sacrifice. 
You <coughs> may want to respond to some of that, but I, I think one thing which came out, which I, I really would like you maybe to address, um, because, because what you were saying in, in your first part was that um, the, the, the Rome is carrying on what wasn't completed on, on, on the night of the Passover. In other words, they did eat, eat, eat the lamb. And, and one of the things that brought, Cecil brought out there was that this was uh, an, uh, uh, an, in an unbloody manner. Mm -hmm. But if it really has the effect of a sacrifice, Hebrews clearly says there can be no forgiveness of sin without the shedding of blood. Mm -hmm. And therefore, how can what is happening in the Mass, which is unbloody, actually fulfill the work which wasn't quite fulfilled? Right, well, I'll deal with uh, your points first, and then I'll come to the question yeah, you just do. asked, if that's OK. Uh, but I will just uh, clarify that they did complete the sacrifice. Then. It's not that the Catholic Church feels that we need to now somehow complete it because it wasn't completed, but rather because they completed it, and because Christ told them to do it again, that's why we do it. Not again as in a repetition, again as a representation. The Mass is a representation of the one time sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Just to come to what you said, I mean, this is 14, paragraph 14, 40, uh, 1545 of the Catechism of the Catholic Church. The redemptive sacrifice of Christ is unique, accomplished once for all, yet it is made present in the Eucharistic sacrifice of the Church. The same is true of the one priesthood of Christ. It is made present through the ministerial priesthood without diminishing the uniqueness of Christ's priesthood. In the words of St. Thomas Aquinas, only Christ is the true priest, the others being only his ministers. So Christ himself did offer himself without spot. It is not the priest who offers himself. It is he who offers Christ in persona Christi. Christ cannot be here with us on earth, so I, but I, he I, has I, I ministered. I say the priest offered himself. Well, okay. The mass is Christ's offering. Christ is the one who offers himself. The, ma the minister of the, the mass on earth is simply the priest. That is all the priest really is. And that is as an anamnesis. As I say, it's a memorial sacrifice. That is what Christ told us to do. It's not about the personal holiness of the priest. The personal holiness of the priest is completely irrelevant because it's not based on our holiness that the sacraments are efficacious. It's a work of God, not a work of man. In the uh, fourth century, there was a heresy called the Donatists. And the Donatists denied that any priest who performed the sacrifice of the mass or performed confessions or anything had any validity because he had committed grave sins in the past. And the church condemned that heresy. We've always rejected the idea that the post holiness of the priest has anything to do with the mass. It is the same sacrifice. That one sacrifice of Christ deals with all sins for all eternity. The mass itself, when we receive the mass, does wash away venial sins because those who have mortal sins are told by St. Paul in 1 Corinthians 11 not to come to receive the Eucharist. If you eat and drink the, body and uh, the bread and the wine you def uh, without being worthy, you defile the body and the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. So those are all the things. The, the, uh, remind me what you were... Yeah, the unbloody sacrifice, uh, right. Hebrews clearly says yes. that without the shedding of blood there can be no forgiveness yes. of sin. So how can any unbloody sacrifice do anything? There are two elements to any sacrifice. There's the immolation and then there's the offering. The immolation. You better explain that. So, immolation is a bloody death. Okay, so take the lamb. The lamb is slain. What's, uh, what's precious about that is that the life within the blood of the lamb is precious and that pays back God. That's the way that the, the Old Testament rituals used to work. So, the immolation happens. That is one historical particularity. Okay, that only happened once. But the offering is something that Christ does for all eternity. He is right now before the Father, in the Holy of Holies, for all eternity, in the eternal present, offering himself to the Father for the forgiveness of our sins. Because that's an eternal present, we offer the same thing, because that eternal present becomes imminent throughout history. That one, that one sacrifice of Christ on Calvary, but in an unbloody manner, in other words, the offering aspect of it, not the killing. Christ isn't killed again and again and again and again. He's offered in the same eternal present as Christ offers himself um, in eternal present before the Father. That's what it means. Uh, Peter says Christ is not actually killed again and again and again. Uh, Pope Pius XII said this concerning what is happening in the Mass. It is no mere empty commemoration of the passion and death of Christ, but a true and proper act of sacrifice, an unbloody immolation, a most acceptable victim. Mm -hmm. To immolate is to put to death. The victim 
it, the host is the victim. This is all the language of sacrifice. Now, Peter says that Christ is in heaven offering the sacrifice. He's not. Hebrews 7, verses 21 through to 27 show clearly there is no need for the sacrifice of the mass. In those verses, the writer of the Hebrews tells of how the Old Testament high priests were mortal men. Their sacrifices only had a temporary effect. They were ineffective. When they died, the merits of those temporary sacrifices, if you like, died with them. So there had to be this conveyor belt of Old Testament priests with animal sacrifices going on Mm -hmm. all the time. But in contrast, he then says, we have a high priest who is perfectly suited for us, who's holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners and made higher than heavens. And this is the part that's important. Who needs not daily to offer up sacrifice. For this he did once when he offered himself up. Mm-hmm. There's no ongoing sacrifices being offered in heaven. It was done and dusted, reverently speaking, at the place called Calvary. This man appeared once at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And when he said, Tetelestai, it is finished, the sacrifice was finished fully. Because uh, when a prisoner was sent to prison in Old Testament times, on the door of the prison, they had a list of all the crimes he had committed. When he had served his sentence, there was a word written over that charge list as he was released. That word was tetelestai, sentence served. And when Christ was on the cross suffering for his people, there was, if you like, and in God's mind, a list of our offenses nailed to the cross. And he was blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that were against us. In other words, the list of sins that we had committed, he was blotting it out by suffering on the cross for us. And when he had served the sentence on the cross for us, tetelestai, it is done. It is not being continued or perpetuated in heaven. Well, the only problem with that, of course, is that the Hebrew sections that you quoted didn't in any way disprove the fact that Christ has gone to the Holy of Holies for all eternity. And when you go into a Holy of Holies as a high priest, there's only one reason you do that, and that is to offer your sacrifice. That sacrifice is an eternal sacrifice. It is always made for us, and it always will be. He but even then, once, can I just ask you a question? Sh- uh, but can I say this? There was no seat in the Holy of Holies in the Old Testament because the work was never completed. Christ is now seated at the yeah, right hand absolutely. of the Father. That means it's finished. He is not offering himself. He's pleading the merits of it for us, but he's not offering. That's the offering. That's the offering. Can I? It's not g- the immolation. Let, let, like let, I say, there is a difference between the immolation and the offering. And although the word immolation is also used in a more general sense for the whole sacrifice, that is sad. Immolation itself does not, I don't claim that Christ is dying again and again and again and again in heaven. What I'm saying is that he's offering the one sacrifice he made in history in an eternal present. He's offering but I want to ask you a question. Are you, are, are you arguing that when he said tetelestai, that what, was a, what he said was accomplished was his redemptive death? That's what you're arguing. The work of redemption was done because what happened when he cried out, it is finished? I'll tell you what happened. The veil of the temple Mm -hmm. was rent from the top to the bottom. Absolutely. And why was that? It meant that sinners believing on Christ had access into the very presence of God, which they could never have done beforehand. And that's why the redemptive work is finished on the cross. But the redemptive work wasn't finished because he hadn't risen. Romans 4.25 says he was risen for our justification. That's not the same thing. What was happening, what happened, tetelestai, what was accomplished, was precisely the sacrifice that he made for the redemption of our sins. That's only one part of his redemptive work. It's not the whole thing. For another thing, he hadn't died yet, and death was necessary for the sacrifice to completely take place. So you're absolutely wrong in saying that when he said tetelestai, it had to do with his whole redemptive work. It certainly had not. Not if we're taking seriously the context, certainly of the cedar real uh, meal ritual. When he accomplished that, the bloody death was accomplished. The cedar meal ritual was accomplished. He had fulfilled the law perfectly. But that tells me absolutely nothing about whether or not he also instituted an anamnesis, a memorial sacrifice, which would bring the benefits of that one-time sacrifice imminent throughout history in an eternal present. So you haven't got me to that. Let me go back to 
Hebrews 7, 27, it says of Christ, he needs not daily to offer up sacrifice. Mm -hmm. For this he did once when he offered up himself. Let me paraphrase what this is teaching. By his ever living Mm -hmm. real presence in the courts of heaven, Christ is the perpetual reminder of his atoning sacrifice that was effectively finished at Calvary. Therefore, no earthly ritual can nor indeed needs to represent it continually on a daily basis. And that's what Rome is claiming to do. I'm afraid that's not the case. Let let, let me move it on. I mean, you'll have the chance to answer because what I'm going to say comes back to to, to the heart of this. Um, uh, Interesting point you make. You said it couldn't have been finished when he said it finished. But several things did happen clearly at that point in time. One of them was that this separation that had been there throughout time, this tremendous veil was torn in two from top to bottom, which meant man had complete access to the Holy of Holies to yeah, God. Absolutely. Now, what I think I'm having difficulty understanding, and if you can sure. help us a little bit, I think one or two people that are writing in are, are getting the same. Why, to, to have a remembrance, mm-hmm. clearly you've mentioned that once or twice, mm-hmm. Um, yes, there is a remembrance. We are to, to, mm. to, to remember him. Mm-hmm. But to have this, which constantly is, is this offering up, mm. seems to me to go against the fact that, one, the veil was torn in two. Mm-hmm. Secondly, Hebrews 1 verse 3, which I'd like you to comment on, and then Cecil afterwards, mm-hmm. if you would, please, where he says, and, and he is the, uh, the, the, the I, I love the authorized, the effulgence, the radiance mm-hmm. uh, o, o, mm-hmm. of his glory, the exact representation of his neighbors, who, uh, his nature, who upholds all things by the word of his power. Mm-hmm. When he had made purification for our sins. When he had mm-hmm. purged our sins, he sat down at the right hand of Absolutely. the majesty on high. Now, that's after his resurrection. That's after his ascension. The thing is finished now. And as you said, okay, if it wasn't actually finished when he said it's finished, it certainly was when he rose from the dead and ascended sure. on Absolutely. high. Why do we need this constant offering up? For the application of the merits of Christ to us in everyday life. Oops. What we need to have, what, we, what Christ gave us was an anamnesis, a memorial sacrifice. He could have used, incidentally, uh, in, in um, Luke, any number of phrases uh, to say, just simply remembrance. I mean, I've got a list of them right here. Uh, he could have said anamnesco, uh, which is uh, there seven times in the, in the New Testament. Mimneskamai, maniomai, mnemoneho, hupermnesco. There are so many words he could have used for simply remembering. They all mean the same thing. They all have this sense of, all have a sort of a mental effort to remember something without any sacrificial content. Isn't it interesting that he used the one word in the entirety of New Testament Greek that had a total identification with a sacrifice? Isn't that interesting? And the reason he did that was precisely so that the sacrifice that we're making is not, again, a different sacrifice to that of Christ. It is exactly the same sacrifice. The sacrifice that Christ made on the cross and he makes together in heaven with the Father is then imminent throughout history. It's not a repetition. It's not a different priest. It's the same priest. It's the same sacrifice. And it is all being made imminent throughout history so that when we receive him bodily, when we, receive the, when we eat his flesh and we drink his blood as he commanded us to do, we receive the blessings from that sacrifice. In other words, the purging of our sins and the grace we need to continue on, the life in us that he said we would have in John 6. That's why we have that. Can I just ask for clarification? Did you, uh, did, did you mean what I thought you said was at that point of taking, mm-hmm. we receive that forgiveness of sins and not before we take? No, we said, well... We receive forgiveness of venial sins in the sense that we are washed of venial sins. We receive forgiveness of mortal sins through confession. But the sacrifice of Christ itself merits for us the grace of God that is then communicated instrumentally through confession and through the Mass. So in other words, there is what what Christ has done by his one-time sacrifice on the cross, which is then imminent throughout history in every Mass, is he has earned for us, he has paid back the debt that we could never pay. Only he can do that. He is the only high priest who can do that because he is the only spotless lamb. We haven't actually heard from Cecil how he can uh, can actually marry that with the fact that if, in fact, they were not eating Jesus at the Last Supper, he did break the law. And if he broke the law, he is not your sinless saviour. He's not my sinless saviour either. The fact that he kept the law by offering himself the lamb in that sacrifice in the Last Supper and that they ate him 
is the only way you can say Jesus fulfilled the law completely and is the perfect propitiatory sacrifice for our sins. Well, uh, the Lord was simply instructing his believers how to call to mind the forthcoming sacrifice that he was going to offer on the cross of Calvary. There is absolutely nothing in Scripture that states that he was instituting some form of perpetuation of the sacrifice of Calvary that was yet to be made. And that is not consistent with Scripture. You cannot read that. You know, as with happens in a lot of cases uh, with Rome, they are guilty of eisegesis. In other words, they're guilty of reading into a text what they would like it to say rather than exegeting the text and taking out of it what it does actually say. Christ was simply instituting a memorial meal for those who were believing in him for their salvation. Uh, If he was wanting them to eat his flesh and drink his blood, Peter has made much about not breaking the law. Well, to eat blood would have been a transgression of the law. And yet Peter, who took part in the Last Supper, when he was in the house of Cornelius uh, in Acts, he says, I have never eaten anything that is unclean. So there is no way that transubstantiation took place at the Last Supper that they were going to drink. It's actually a very easy answer to that, Cecil, which is that Christ had already declared all foods clean in his uh, Sermon on the Mount. So there was no problem with eating blood at that point because Christ had already declared it clean. And he's reminded in Acts 10 in his vision by God, do not call clean or unclean what I have called, past tense, clean. So that that makes absolutely no difference whatsoever. So you're happy with a sort of cannibalistic type interpretation of the Last Supper. That's, what, that's what you're saying. I'm quite happy with the idea that I am eating the flesh and drinking the blood of Christ under the species of bread and wine. The reason why it's not cannibalism is because they are not under the species of flesh and blood. You know, the accidents, if you like, the physical properties of bloodiness and fleshiness, which would be absolutely abhorrent to us as human beings, which is precisely why God gave us them in the very species of bread and wine, calling back to the order of Melchizedek. So this that's is exactly truly, this why it's is a truly a miracle that is taking place. Absolutely. Well, tell me this. Can you tell me some other miracle in the scripture that was neither visible nor verifiable? Not that I can think of. Perhaps so relevant? this is good, the exception to the rule you're saying. Why not? Why should it not be? I mean, at the end of the day, I cannot prove to you the resurrection of Christ. I take that on faith. I don't take it on reasonable faith because no, the all the... Can, the I, can, I can I finish? Can I finish? The scriptures the, the point, witnesses to it. Absolutely, but they're not proof in terms of absolute empirical verification. The scriptures are really good reasons for believing that Christ's resurrection took place. They are excellent it historical is witnesses. and verifiable. But not to us. But to, everything the, you to believe, those who saw it. Cecil, everything you believe is not physical or verifiable. The everything you believe at the Last Supper was not visible or verifiable, and it's not be. visible or doesn't verifiable you're taking, a, you're taking a, a principle from Scripture that simply isn't there, no. and that's my problem with that. But if we actually look at the actual text of itself of the Scriptures, <laughs> we actually go back to Luke. What does it actually say? What, is, what does Christ actually say? He actually says, and let me just find it actually in here. Tau to estin to soma mu to huper humen didomenon. Okay, in Greek, adjectives have genders, right? They agree with the nouns that form their objective. So, tau to, this is a neuter. It has to have a neuter noun to agree with it. It can't therefore be artos, bread. You would have to argue, oh, well, this is just a symbol. It's a symbol of and trying to give us a memorial. But it cannot possibly be that from the text. The only noun in that sentence that can possibly correspond with tau to is exactly the other neuter one, which is. Soma, body, this is my body. Or rather, what it's saying is, like um, a strict translation would be, uh, not this, here is not this bread, as in it represents my body, but this, brackets, new substance, is my body, or the body of me. That's what it means. He means it. The same principle works in Matthew 26, 28 with the precious blood. It's tautu ga estin to haima mu. Tautu, again, it corresponds to blood, haima, the new to noun, not to oinos, wine, which is a masculine noun. So you cannot take that interpretation from the text. It is utterly contrary to the Greek grammar. And I, I think that's just, actually St. Paul makes this really good in 1 Corinthians 11, 24. He makes it even clearer. He actually says, tautu mu esti to soma. So mu, me, comes immediately after tautu. So the phrasing is, this of me is the body. He connects this to Jesus the person, after, and then adding me after this and before body. 
So he's actually making it even clearer. So there are so many reasons exegetically where this is actually saying, Jesus is saying, this is my body broken for you. Do this as an anamnesis, a memorial sacrifice of me. What is a memorial sacrifice? It is a sacrifice that makes present again the thing that it is bringing to memorial. So I'm afraid the Bible totally disagrees you, with you. You quoted verse 24 of 1 Corinthians 11 in support of what you've just said. Mm-hmm. It's interesting that three verses later, Paul actually says, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup. He's not talking about the body and the blood. It's still bread. It's still wine. No, not, no miraculous, unverifiable, invisible I've already said miracle the species, has taken I've already place. said the species of bread and wine, but the actual substance is the body and blood of Christ, and that's what we see exegetically from the text. C- c- can I ask you a question here, uh, which um, from what you've said, and it, it, you, know, uh, y- you obviously believe what you've said. Um, but have you not jumped somewhere? In other words, Jesus held up a piece of bread mm-hmm. and in your understanding, he said, this piece of bread is my body. Mm-hmm. Well, How? He says, this is my body. Yeah, well, okay, yeah, but, the, but yeah. the this, as yeah, you were this. saying, was the bread. In other words, you, you're saying it this clearly, this has mm-hmm. to be his body. Mm-hmm. How then can that be transposed to thousands and thousands and thousands of wafers. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's not saying that, is it? Well, it is. Uh, so how, how is it? Saying, I, I know this I'd like you to answer <laughs> this as well. Do, so if you're saying do this as an anamnesis of me, then it follows that anyone who does do that as an anamnesis, as a memorial sacrifice of Christ, is in fact dealing with the body and blood of Christ. Why does that make sense? Because this is the risen body of Christ. Christ, in his risen body, did things that as his, in his beforehand just human body could not do. So for example, he, he, he appears places. You don't find that in the pre-risen Christ. You find it in the risen Christ. The risen Christ, in his glorified body in heaven, has supernatural properties, divine communication properties that are much more than the, simple, the, the purely human properties he had before he had risen. Actually, I find it actually quite denigrating to the wonder that will be heaven for us in our glorified bodies to deny the possibility that Christ can indeed have his body and his blood present in all the Eucharist throughout the world for all believers. How do you see this, Cecil? Because uh, I, I know we're, we're going to run way out of time before we've even started uh, delving into this. But th- the whole area of transubstantiation means that every wafer in every Catholic church in, throughout the whole world becomes, uh, is the body and, 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 and blood there. How, how do you see that? And why to you can that not be the case? Well, first of all, Peter, Peter was saying that at the Last Supper when Christ said, this is my body. That was the first that case of transubstantiation. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, in fact, when he said, this is my body, which is given for you, this is my blood, which is poured out, which is shed for you. Mm-hmm. The Greek participles can actually be translated in a future sense. This is my body, which will be given my blood which will be poured out. And you're shaking your head, Peter, but let me, qu- let me quote the New American Catholic Bible, mm-hmm. Luke 22, 19 and 20. This is my body which will be given for you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood which will be shed for you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, the, it's just... a bit like a commentator, Frankel, ran his last, probably, race last Saturday and won 14 out of 14. Now, as Frankel's parading in the paddock, the commentator might say, Frankel is running for, say, Sir Henry (laughs) Cecil, his uh, trainer, but he's not actually running at that moment. He's parading in the paddock. You can use that participle in the sense of he will be running, and that's exactly the same sense as what's happening for when Christ spoke at the last. Well, I'm afraid that doesn't simply wo- that simply doesn't work with the fact that this is didomenen, which is the actual word we're talking about here, given body, given for you, is a present participle. And whenever you have participles in Greek, they always have to agree with the main verb in terms of their tense. Sorry, tense for you, if your audience means per, uh, I, I think past. You half our audience with with the, are, the, are the you dominant past. So can I just finish it? Well, yeah, are you I, 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 I'm, I'm happy to wrong? say that they're talking nonsense because, frankly, a participle 
has to agree with the tense of the main verb. So tense is past, present, or future. In this case, the actual tense, uh, where, where is the actual verb? Oh, yes, it's is. <laughs> it's estim. So it actually is. So again, you're having two presents there. And actually, the fact that Jesus is using the present twice was literally giving to his, he's saying he's giving his body to his apostles at that point in time. It's actually intensifying the fact he's giving his body to but his apostles, which grammatically, that's the only way it can so work. So you're saying that this is the sacrifice body, he's giving it to them now, even though the sacrifice has not yet taken Absolutely, place. Do you believe that God wants to defy our natural reasoning and senses? No, because he's giving well, he's his... doing it according to what you're teaching. Not at all. He's Guys, giving, what he's I, doing I, I'm is... I'm going to call a halt just for a minute, and I'm going <laughs> to read some emails. Um, uh, Adam, ages ago, this one came in. Brother Doug, is Revelation TV anti-Catholic? No, it's not. Otherwise, we wouldn't have invited Peter here. <laughs> he knows. We're sharing together, so... Absolutely. Uh, no, Absolutely not there. Um, Yvonne uh, says it, uh, it, it, a poem about transubstantiation. I haven't got uh, time to read the poem, Yvonne, but thank you for it. It's just a symbol to remember Christ's sacrifice. The priest can't change it into real blood and flesh. We're not cannibals. Much love, uh, Yvonne. Um, no, uh, no, Doug, no church is perfect. No, uh, we fully agree with that. Uh, Doug, please ask Peter. Okay, I, I'll give you a couple of minutes to answer this one, okay. and, and you can answer, Cecil, if you want to as well. Which verse in the Bible defines and distinguishes between mortal and venal sins? Oh, that's easy. 1 John 5, 16 to 17. There are sins that lead to death, and there are sins that do not lead to death. Okay, mm. you've got your answer. Cecil, do you want to be actually as quick or no? <laughs> it, it doesn't actually mean that. There are certain sins that we commit which may well lead to us dying. That's not the context. The context that is spiritual is, death. It's not actual death. No. I, well, we'll just have, have to agree to disagree on it. But one thing that I haven't actually heard Peter answer yet, uh, and you have asked several times, and that is how can the unbloody sacrifice propitiate the wrath of God when it's clear that without shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. I haven't heard... Because the blood's already been shed. It's called Calvary. It's the same sacrifice offered on Calvary. You don't have to shed blood again. It is the taking of the victim. He shed his blood and is the offering of that victim, which is the last part of the sacrifice, which happens at every Mass. The reason it's unbloody, even though we are, we are coming back to Calvary every but single time we go to Mass... supposed to be one single back. sacrifice. And the, one, the single sacrifice at Calvary was a bloody sacrifice. Absolutely. So therefore, you've got another sacrifice. It's no, not the same. Not at all, because the blood's already been shed. The part of the sacrifice which is being there at the point of the mass is the Listeners, offering, not the immolation. This? <laughs> well, if well, you can't, I'm sure those people can. Well, let's find out if the, if the listeners understand it by reading a few more of their emails. Um, the role of the priest in, in the Roman Catholic Church denies that Jesus died and made a complete sacrifice. Um, hi, Doug. <laughs> He's saying no. Okay. Uh, hi, Doug. Also, Jesus is sat down at the Father's right hand. Sin is dealt with. It's done. Uh, and how come Catholics tell a priest their sin? How can a sinner, which every man is, including the Catholic priest, forgive sins? Jeanette, we're not answering that question tonight, but you're asking it. Um, uh, I'm happy to give a quick answer, if you Go like. on, then. The quick answer is that every priest is simply doing, is being the instrument of Christ. Christ, in confession, forgives sins, not the priest. And... You, Cecil at the beginning was saying, of course, uh, nobody is like Christ, therefore maybe c can they do the it? The priest is simply an instrument. Okay. It doesn't matter how holy or unholy he is, in fact. It is Christ who uses him as well, an instrument. Why did the apostle Peter say to Simon the sorcerer, you know, if you want your sins forgiven, you better approach God. He didn't say you need to get a priest. In fact, come to me, because according to what you say, Peter was the first pope. Why didn't Peter say, look, you need to confess that to me? But rather he told Simon the sorcerer to seek baptized. out God. He hadn't been baptized yet. He hadn't, you can't be... Who hadn't been baptized? Simon the sorcerer. Yes, he had been. Had he at that point? Yes, he had been. Okay. Uh, perhaps he just needs to, well, perhaps <laughs> that includes confession, I don't know. Well... <laughs> Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think, you know, the, 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 if, I, if I were a priest and I was going to kill issues someone, here, very much so. if, I, if I were a priest and I was going to bring someone back to repentance, I would say you need to say sorry to God. And if the instrumentality of that 1, is entirely separate. First John 1 tells us if we confess our sins, he 
is faithful and just to forgive if us. If we confess our sins, yes. absolutely. To we, God, that's yeah. who we, and we make do it our confession through the agency to. of the priest, which no. is precisely why in There's John 20, verses 20, verse 23, one he said, time, please, otherwise he said, nobody will it, hear. Can I just say, in John, 20, in John 20, verse 23, what does he say to the apostles? He gives them the authority to forgive sins. He breathes them and says, you have the forgive, authority to forgive sins. Whoever sins you forgive, they are forgiven. Whoever sins you retain, they are retained. He instituted confession right there. No, and that is exactly why throughout all Christian history until the 16th century, we always had confession. Acts you are ahistorical. Acts 17, Paul on Mars Hill says that through this man there is the forgiveness of sins, yes. and it comes as you confess directly to God. You do not go to a sinner to forgive your sins. You go to the okay, sinless guys, one. Guys, we're not really talking about that tonight, so <laughs> and there are so many issues here. Uh, the Christians are commanded in the New Testament to refrain from eating blood. Uh, Acts 15 and 21 comes a state Christians aren't to consume blood. S several are coming back to this. Um, uh, uh, the, you can the, tell them that, that all foods were declared clean by, by Christ. By that point, by the point they, they were coming to the Last Supper, that was declared clean. Okay. Uh, does Peter believe, I think you're not Apostle Peter, <laughs> does Peter <laughs> believe in being born again? Of course I do. Okay. By baptism. You're bo oh, wow. <laughs> That's well, just I, I, was just, I was just going to. I was just going to ask which of the many Donkey baptisms Pike. in the New Testament are you talking about? Christian baptism. Which which baptism places you in the body of Christ? Christian baptism in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, as by, Christ told us by, to do. By what agency? By what agency? What yeah. do you mean? W w what baptism? What are you baptized with? Water. Water First and the Spirit, Corinthians John 3, 12. 5, we are baptized with water and the Spirit. By one Spirit are we all baptized into one body. Yeah. And that comes through, I'll, I'll come to it in our closing comments. Yes, okay. why not? Uh, Mary says, just read the book of Eucharist miracles if you want visible proof of a miracle. That's a very good point. Um, that's, uh, um, uh, Paul says, the bread and wine which you receive at Mass is the body and blood of Christ. Uh, you... I don't quite know what he's saying yeah I have always oh I, I, I think he's saying to take taking us I'm not quite sure what he's what he's at oh I see yeah he's saying us Protestants okay I'm getting now uh, we've always been stupid um, uh, uh, and uh, so okay. uh, bless you Paul uh, thank you for that <laughs> uh, I, I'm so glad Peter's nicer than that than uh, than you are, uh, as far as that is concerned. Um, okay, uh, let's. I, I, I mean, to me, I, I, I think that this whole issue. I mean, one of the things, and maybe just quickly answer this before we get on to our closing okay. statements. We, we, we've talked about this this whole thing of of offering, but in John 6:53, okay. he, he said, while still before the cross, before anywhere, didn't he? He said, "This is my body." Body, which is given for you that you know drink take my body eat 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 my body drink my blood but at that point they couldn't do it mm -hmm. now so even before the sacrifice mm -hmm. he was saying that therefore it has to have another meaning doesn't it no not at all actually I mean it's interesting that he says to begin with he actually says Fargo he does see it say eat that is to eat and then as soon as they object to this, they say, oh, hang, hang on, how, did, how can this work? He actually intensifies it. Rather than saying, as he would have done in every single other one of his parables, he makes it clear when he's making a parable, par parabolic point. He then says, he, he actually says, um, truly, truly, I say to you, amen, amen. It's an intensifier. It's a double expletive. He's saying, no, no, truly, I say to you, quite literally, unless you eat the flesh of the, drink, uh, and of the Son of Man and drink his blood. By the way, the word eat there is not fargo. It's trogo. It's actually nor. He's saying, you have to gnaw on my flesh. He's actually making it stronger. Rather than discouraging them from the obvious mistake that they will have been making, he's actually encouraging them down the line. Now, either Jesus is encouraging them into error, which would make him a liar, and that, again, has serious Christological consequences, or he means exactly <coughs> what they think he means. Okay. So he's encouraging cannibalism. No, not so. Can I answer this? Yes, you can. We're, we're, we're having to get, we've got about three minutes each to sum up. Uh, so okay. do that and, and add your summary to it, please. Verse 53 must be taken on the context of what went before. Mm -hmm. And it was, of course, about the manna uh, that the Old Testament people had. And Jesus says, I am the living bread mm -hmm. that come down from heaven. And he says, uh, the bread that I shall give is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. And he's talking about Calvary, the sacrifice Absolutely. on Calvary. And six times in 13 verses, he says 
to come to him and to believe on him is to have eternal life. And he likens coming to him to eating. He likens believing on him to drinking. He doesn't say that. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. He that comes to me shall never hunger. That Mm -hmm. means, and he that believes in me shall never thirst. He's using coming as a form of eating, believing as a form of drinking. And then later on, they want to eat something because they're mistakenly hung up with the manna. And he uses this figurative food language to equal, equate to believing on him as he had said earlier on. And one final point, John 6 is a totally different context from the Last Supper. John 6 is about the means of being saved, coming and believing the Last Supper is a memorial. You know, in language, you're not to mix your metaphors. But unfortunately, when it comes to the Mass, taking John 6 and the Last Supper passages, Rome is mixing spiritual metaphors. We are to compare Scripture with Scripture to get the truth. We're not to contaminate Scripture with Scripture, and you end up with a false doctrine. As I've already shown, when you actually look at the grammar of the Greek, when you actually look at the context, and I've brought in the whole context, and you simply haven't answered either of those points, Cecil, when you look at that context in its entirety, we are not talking about figurative language. We're not talking about spiritual meaning on its own. I don't deny, incidentally, actually, that there could be an an, an analogical meaning to this, because actually uh, Catholics have always believed you have the literal, the analogical, and other forms of meaning as well in Scripture. Scripture is very rich, and they're not as mono-meaning as that we are today. Nonetheless, when he talks in John 6, he uses the word sarks, rather flesh rather than body. He's using more visceral language. He's being either deliberately very misleading, and he says elethes, indeed. Elethes is always used in the New Testament in connection with nouns that are literal and not metaphorical. They're always used to validate oral or written statements, not to suggest that there's another meaning to them. So you're, I'm afraid you've totally mistaken the context. You've not taken the, the broader Jewish context into consideration, nor have you taken the Greek grammar, and that's why your entire doctrine is so hey, historical. You can respond. We've, we've no, got I hope we, uh, we're running out of time. No, we've yeah. got a couple of minutes left, so okay. you, you can both respond to one another again. Sure. Right. Is this, is this uh, ending statements? Uh, yes. Sure, brilliant. Yes. Yep. And st- final yeah, statements? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Take another minute. I'm going into the final statement? Yeah. Okay. You, well, I th- sorry, I thought you started your final. You've got about a minute for your final statement now. Then. Know, right. <laughs> Basically, Rome teaches that through the operation of priestly administered sacraments, spiritual changes and results are achieved, ex opere operato. Scripture teaches that spiritual change and results arise from the interaction between God's Word and God's Spirit. New birth as an example. Mm -hmm. Peter says, seeing that ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the Word of God, which lives and abides forever. In the parable of the sower, the seed is the Word of God. And as we preach the truth, the Word of God, by the Spirit, that brings new life within a person, not some external uh, right. Uh, It's not by works of righteousness that we are saved, but according to his mercy, he saves us by the washing of regeneration. Regeneration is described as a washing, Mm -hmm. and it comes through uh, the word and the spirit acting in tandem together. I presume I'm running very much out of time. Okay, let me just close with Bart Brewer was a Carmelite priest and a dear friend of mine who was saved (laughs) out of Rome and he's now in glory. He said, Catholic doctrine teaches that the priest is endowed with power to change the bread and wine of the mass into the literal body and blood of Christ. This doctrine is nothing more than a medieval superstition foisted on the church. Purpose was to make the people (laughs) believe that the priests had miraculous powers and to cause them to think that they were dependent on the priest for salvation. There's not one verse in the Bible that clearly supports it. On the cross, he cried, it is finished. The doctrine of transubstantiation is not only say, Harry, it's blasphemy. That is the word of an ex-Catholic priest, now in glory, saved alone by grace. Okay. Peter. Well, what we've heard this evening from the other side, I'm afraid, are simply a lot of false dichotomies. Uh, For example, no one claims that works of righteousness save you, independent of the grace of God. The washing of regeneration isn't separate to baptism. Baptism is the washing of regeneration. 1 Peter 3.21 says... 
Baptism now saves you, not as a washing of dirt from the body, as an external ritual, but as an appeal for a clear conscience. If you're saved simply by faith alone, why are you appealing for a clear conscience in baptism again? By the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. That makes no sense. But the point is, what Christ has given us are sacraments. Sacraments are instrumental means by which we attain the grace of God that he, by his sacrifice alone on the cross, merited for us. And that is represented to us by the sacrifice of the Mass and the Eucharist. Uh, I'll just uh, end by saying, look, this is a quote from Ignatius of Antioch, who is a bishop of the church in 110 AD. This is how far back this goes, ladies and gentlemen. Consider how contrary to the mind of God are the heterodox in regard to the grace of God which has come to us. They abstain from the Eucharist and from prayer because they do not admit that the Eucharist is the flesh of our Savior, Jesus Christ, the same flesh which suffered for our sins, and which the Father in his graciousness raised from the dead. I have seen nothing this evening to sell me that Ignatius of Antioch and the other early Christians for 1,500 years were wrong. Rather, ladies and gentlemen, can I just say, don't run screaming from the synagogue in Capernaum in John 6, but rather stay with Christ and eat. Okay, uh, obviously we've scratched the surface. I'm sure I'll get two of you back here another time for round two uh, at some point. You need to go and check the scriptures out for yourself. Just a couple of things then. Pat writes in and says, does not scripture say confess your sins one to another? I would rather confess them to a priest than a friend. Alan says, all sin is mortal. The Bible teaches the spiritual context. Every sin is the death penalty, eternal separation from God. Everybody has a different opinion. Thank you for joining us. Seek the scriptures. See you again very soon. Thank you both very much. Bye for now.